You are listening to The Worlding Podcast, where we explore the relationship of how we are both, shaping and being shaped by our surroundings. The podcast traces interconnections by inviting each episode's guest to pass on the mic to someone who has influenced their world. And now, here's your host, dance artist Renee Schadler. Hello, friends. Today, we're continuing our sixth string figure with my guest, Ali Bishop. Ali is a writer, artist, and researcher whose work is an exploration of materiality as movement. Ali comes from a background in microbiology and the visual arts, and today we'll share her current thinking around fatigue, which I'm sure a lot of us can relate to, and techniques for attuning with the more than human, which includes sparrows, spiders, strangers, and even laptops with which we are in relation. Thanks so much for chatting with us today. Hey, Renee, thanks for having me. To open our conversation, can you share with listeners a little insight into your current world, perhaps how the light or your notes are affecting you in this current moment? Sure. I am in my um, living room come office in my apartment in Wedding in Berlin. Um, it's a beautiful, spacious, light-filled apartment. Uh, I currently have notes spread, notes and books and pillows spreading spread across my desk. Um, and if I peek over the top of my screen, I have a view out to the balcony and the birdhouse that my partner Jesper built. So every morning uh, we, we give these, we, have, we carpet the floor of this birdhouse with half a paper cup of seeds for the sparrows who swarm in the bushes below and come up and visit us. And I'm watching some of them right now. Um, and what these sparrows are doing, not right now as I'm doing this podcast, but outside of this moment, I'm trying to think through a paper around birds and language. And so I'm trying to think with these sparrows uh, through watching them. Um, and here I'm, I'm also trying to think with this beautiful ethologist called Vincienne Despre, who's written a lot about how she relates to animals, birds and others and how she tries to bring a, a polite curiosity to the encounter. And in that way, she kind of enlarges in her imagination the things that these birds are capable of. And um, from that sees how that shifts her understanding, her thinking about um, the capacities of these animals, their behaviours, and what sort of propositions come out of that. Oh, I really enjoy that curiosity. I think that's so important when attuning to the more than human and with the more than human. And I can see you now in my imagination looking out on the balcony and I imagine actually the door perhaps having a window kind of in the top part of the door. So it would be a little bit like the sparrows are moving up and down, in and out of your sight. So I imagine that also gives a beautiful rhythm, actually, quite spontaneous to your work day. A hundred percent. Because I know, Ali, you're very active in lots of different fields, um, a little bit of a person with many hats, I could say, and you were recently in Finland, so you were there for an artistic residency And that, again, was a different place from the one you explain now in your apartment. How was it for you going to Finland and other different residencies you've attended um, and experiencing your work in these different locations? Yeah, um, this was a really, really beautiful residency. It's on an island called Örö. I'm sorry, I probably said that incorrectly. And nobody really lives there. There's just this one residency house. And in summer... There's hotels and people camping, but the residency runs all the year round, and it's also an old sort of army island, so it has all of these weird artifacts from that. But you know, as is weirdly quite often the case with um, territories that have been taken over by armies for training purposes or other, you have this kind of lush proliferation of of. Um, uh, I don't, I don't like to say the natural world, but the, the, the bodies, the trees, the birds, the insects, the butterflies that 
Um, and normally they could really just flourish without too much uh, human intervention except for the, you know, drill exercises. So, you know, I was really, really excited to go there. And what I really wanted to do was to explore the kelp forests that that ring this island and others like it. I had this brand new hydrophone and I was going to test it out there, listening and thinking with... Um, the bodies that move through these sort of underwater forests and to think about that in terms of, you know, ecologies and practices of relation in, in these kinds of really specific uh, landscapes. Wow, that's a beautiful parallel, actually, from the apartment window to a kelp forest mm-hmm. underwater. It's really almost turning things on their head. How is it then working in this space, also being, I guess, outside of your normal environment, did it affect the inner workings of your project in any way? Yes, it did. I think we were, you and I were having a chat and, you know, I'll explain to listeners now, I have quite often this tension between, you know, ambition and and fruition or what I would like to do and then what is possible or what the the event or, or encounter or space is, is tending me toward if that makes sense. So I had, you know, these kinds of ambitions for what I wanted to do and explore on this island. But, you know, the, to this sort of mythologies and the sensory material dynamics of this these beautiful kelp forests. And it was also, I should say, a, um, a Finnish summer. So, you know, you have these wonderful long days where the, the sun sets at or near midnight. And it's really just such a... a a rich and wonderful and obviously very different um, environment and landscape to be in. And when I got there, I was just overcome with this overwhelming wash of fatigue. Um, I I couldn't get out of bed. You know, I had this wonderful um, sort of polyphony of voices around me, birds. There were it's a it's an island that's rich with. Uh, butterflies and moths so you have lepidopterists who are attracted there and you know there's this kind of like really rich ballet of things happening outside my window and I could I couldn't really get out of bed Mm. and so it was this really strange thing of feeling like this this joyful exuberance of a burst of heat because it was overly hot in this Nordic summer and I I could barely walk outside Mm. I have been, you know, struggling with this fat- this fatigue actually since then. That was summer of last year, and you know, having to spend a lot of this time coming to terms with the limits of my body, and to try to imagine how I can wrest something generative or affirmative from it. Mm, I think during the current pandemic, a lot of people are experiencing fatigue, whether it may be working parents whose children have to be homeschooled as they're in quarantine or people managing the constant rescheduling of events or simply the stress of navigating your way through a city within these constantly changing health regulations. Did you manage through this process to develop techniques that allowed you to continue or was it more a surrendering to the process of the internal world, I guess you could say? I think it's probably a bit of both. I think that resistance is maybe where it starts to feel even more exhausting um, and that surrendering to it can actually um, be that that sort of generative moment. So, you know, this leads into this idea of, you know, the, the topic of this podcast is about welding and that, it, that it's imminent to experience. So it has to, to also speak to all of the interplays of affects that are drawing the contours of your sense in that moment. Mm. So, you know, fatigue was then this, like a lure or a proposition for me to sense the space differently. Like how could it help me shift out of, you know, whatever tendencies or habits of perception I usually use to engage with landscape or ecology, the kinds of habits that led me to even have a really firm idea of what I wanted to explore in this place, you know, how could 
fatigue helped me to read this ecology with um, more curiosity and, and generosity and sensitivity. Um, and so the contours of the project started to change and, you know, I started to think of uh, the project, the landscape rather, as a kind of a pull between these two forces that my own body was, was feeling t- pulled between and they were um, sleep and ambition or desire. And so I started to think about um, the landscape and my own sort of movement through it in terms of these two forces, but also through these um, sort of mythical figures of eros and hypnos, so desire and, and sleep or death. It really resonates actually with a previous podcast with Diego Agujo around dilettantism and mm. uh, betraying ambition and how to maintain some connection perhaps with the nature of our materiality as bodies when there is a different type of welding happening in parallel to the welding we've been privileged to look at perhaps I can say during the podcast really about the natural cycles and animals and geologic time in the previous episode Mm. and the time scale and pressures of a capitalistic world, a world with a certain requirement and expectations of a very typical, often white male body. And it's interesting, I think, to see how much agency you can create within your natural state of listening to that and releasing to that. So in what you're saying, I think that really rubs up against this idea actually of the expectation on one side and then the reality of the situation and the thinking feeling on the other. Yeah. I mean, I think for me, I still, I, I struggle a lot with this gap, but I'm, I'm you know, I'm a slow learner, I think, mm-hmm. <laughs> but I, but I still feel like when things start to feel less like a knot is when you do sort of surrender to what can emerge when you actually let go into what is happening and to feel into that more fully. And I also feel like, I don't know, for me it's it's useful to use like these kind of mythopoetic figures um, perhaps as another device for sort of getting out of these habits of, of thinking landscape or non-human bodies mechanistically um, to think of them you know, through this kind of mythopoetic figure, thinking up a little bit. Yeah. Mm. And I think for me, eros is becoming more and more, like desire is becoming more and more a kind of a lure or proposition that allows me to think about, you know, this thresholds between human and non-human differently, um, to try to think about non-human desire Um and how that sort of unhinges a lot of these expectations and assumptions around that relation and can be really quite generative. And how do you go about that process of playing with these figures? I don't know how to answer that sort of in a, in a fair way because a lot of my sort of the way that I come at it is really, um, I don't want to say intuitive as a way that kind of then becomes opaque and and you know, disallows any description of what's going on. But I, I think it's part of that surrendering and letting, letting your mind wander with those possibilities. Um, I'm not, I should also say that I'm not in any way um, a traditionalist in terms of like the histories of these mythological figures. I'm very much um, uh, not staying to the narrative as such but thinking of um, possibilities otherwise. I think there's there's an idea here that um, comes from this philosopher, Alfred North Whitehead, which is that it's more important that something be interesting than that it be true. Mm. So for me, that's kind of like how I, it, you know, whether it be mythological figures or scientific facts, I'm, I'm not so much interested in tending to them, you know, in their sort of concreteness, but as thinking is how how can they move my my thinking, my making differently? How can they sort of lure this process of thinking and making differently 
Mm. Is it about almost channeling these figures that you have a moment when you're like, okay, I'm going to connect with my inner eros and follow my desire, perhaps in this animalistic, reproductive way of finding a mate, let's say, and then something coming forward with the hypnos energy and then surrendering to that and having a a day in bed, for example. Like if we try and just make it very pragmatic, is there this this kind of way of playing with the these, I guess, symbols as well? Or is it something that they're storing together? Yeah, I mean, I don't think it's so much that I inhabit those figures because you know, it's, I'm no, I'm not a historian of, of Greek mythology in the sense that I can know precisely what um, historically or even poetically there's, they um, uh, embody in concrete sort of terms. But um, uh, I think there's perhaps maybe like a power for me then to not think of like this fatigue as a defeat, but to think of how you know, it, it was a god, it was this kind of, it's this image that had some kind of a power and reverence that maybe is a way of also thinking about um, how it can be affirmative. And, you know, I'm also thinking a lot around in my, like, other conceptual work around things like, because, um, you know, sleep, this figure of, of hypnos also sometimes gives way to a figure of death and to think about this death life interplay or the death life relation and how to think death affirmatively so I guess it's along those lines of what are the figures the thought objects the propositions that help me to find something you know something powerful maybe in this um wash of of fatigue Mm, that is very joyful actually to think about sleep as a god (laughs) (laughs) right I think that's amazing. You just you 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 spend time with the god of rest. I mean, it's um there's so much around this sort of particular cultural context we find ourselves in this very accelerated um sort of capitalistic ambition that overcodes everything that we do and that we you know this idea that we have to be very like hyper productive. Um and I'm very much guilty of of sort of being swayed to that um, imperative as well. But I think that something happens when you you shift past that and think about sleep as something that you have to honour, sleep as something that has a role in the construction, the worlding of landscape. Sleep is a really important part of it. And sleep is also, you know, in interplay with all these other forces and desires. Um, that makes it just as important as, as, as anything else. So that it's, yeah, it's very much an agent in the, in the constitution of worlds. Mm. I'd love to further that thought around the internal and external world and this perceived border we have between the two. I think the podcast is really advocating for the nature within the body, not being so separate from the nature in a SIM card or the nature in a concrete wall, for example. And I feel like we're kind of in this conversation around the internal world being the fatigue and the current state within what we define as our our body. And then the external as being the landscape in your apartment or the landscape in Finland or the landscape in the listeners' headphones while they are on the tram, while they're riding a bike or whatever they find themselves in in the moment. Could you talk a little bit to that about how within the same landscape there are very unique experiences depending on this Massive vibration, I guess we could say, that is the individual. I'm often coming up against um, sort of taking aim at a lot of these kind of categorical thresholds like self, other, body, world, human, non-human, or internal, external. You know, I think another thing that hypnos or engaging this idea of hypnos does for me is to make that connection between the fatigue that I'm feeling and the fatigue that washes over flowers at the end of the day as they curl up, you know, in rhythm with this, 
the um, setting of the sun, you know, to think of it not as something internal to me, but that I can also locate and see in in the movements, um, in the fluxes around me. And there's, you know, on a subjective level, there's some comfort you can get from that as well. To think of it as not this kind of burden that or cross to carry, but as something, a force that is in and of worlds that are, you know, relational and specific and particular to place and particular to to bodies. Um, and trying to find those threads that weave your body through with the, the kinds of movements that are happening in, you know, this kind the the outside, I've got scare quotes around that. I mean, of course, there is, an, there is your body and things that are held within that membrane and then there are things that are outside of it. But, you know, I think there's a lot of um, thinking that I've also been taking up around, you know, symbiosis and science and, the, and post-human theory about the porosity of bodies. And, and, I mean, I think this is what Worlding speaks to, this kind of relational interpenetration that that is the event of worlding that you know that happens differently for the different bodies that are you know in any particular place you know so like as you say worlding doesn't describe something universal you know it's there's not a universal world like a thought object even though we do of course refer to it and you know can can summon that image but worlding as an event, as a kind of a process, you know, I'm welding in this room, you're welding in your room, the spider in the web in the corner of my room is welding. And of course, the world that they're sort of um, inventing or inventing, the world that they're part of takes a very different shape because, you know, they're essentially blind, they have vibrational sensitivities, they use their web as, a, as an instrument for sensing for translating the world's movement so you know of course so then within this this particular room that I'm sitting in there's multiple worldings that are happening um within this, this kind of like very specific spatial place and contours I think that leads in also very nicely to these more than human artistic techniques I remember reading that on your website and thinking how is the more than human which embraces myself, it embraces technology, it embraces the organic the worlds, the oceanic worlds. How are they artistic? It was, it was really yeah. this moment of like, are they being artistic or that, are we all inherently artistic? But then I kind of understood it's because you're filtering it through the lens of artistic practice. Can you talk a little bit to that, like how to find this artisticness in the more than human, or is that from your lens of welding? I think it was from my lens of welding, and also that sort of phrase, or that you probably came across, was particular to the welding of my um, PhD thesis, which is its own, you know, <laughs> very strange world. But um, you know, I had this particular set of definitions. You know, with the thesis, you have to be a lot more um, sort of concrete then my tendencies are, which is to be really plural and open and, and moving in tangents in every direction. So I was working with a, a set of definitions around what the more than human might mean in, in the context of someone who um, has a processual sort of art, art praxis, so one that's kind of more interested in processes than in objects that you might create. Um, and, you know, the, as you well know, <laughs> Uh, the more than human has so many different definitions depending on its disciplinary context, you know, or the, or the essay it's being mobilised in. Um, when I wrote my thesis, the more than human kind of took shape from my reading of the philosophies of uh, Henri Bergson, who's like 20th century white male French philosopher, um, but still had some really beautiful ideas about how to think about perception, intellection, temporality. You know, he had this, basically he had this idea that really captivated me, which is that human, and here obviously in scare quotes, you know, as if there's some absolute image of the human. However, he had an idea that human perception, 
tends to reify or filter um, a reality that is constantly moving, so like matter in movement, that we tend to, to reify or filter that and into static and graspable objects because that's how intellection works for us. And so he had ideas about how we could go above this human turn in, in perception to move beyond these kind of perceptual habits so that we could attend more generously to the, the rich and multiple affordances and movements of a world welding. So all of these kinds of affective forces and intensities that our perception was you know, filtering out, but that nonetheless participate in our experience and event of being in and of a world. And um, it also took, takes shape, of course, from Erin Manning, who I know that you have encountered and worked with before. And, you know, she had, has a way of mobilizing the more than human so that it kind of becomes a provocation that asks, you know, what else is given in experience? Mm. In relation to that, I find when practicing this more than human attention and curiosity to the more than human, it can often lead to overwhelm, which then in turn perhaps could even lead to the god of sleep. Yeah. But there is this moment of things overlapping, I could say, or obviously there's a, a lot of fiction in that. There's a lot of imagining. And I think it's interesting when there is the space and the time to have these more nuanced understandings and perhaps a slower movement through certain tasks or certain spaces and then how to maintain that when perhaps the pace increases. Um, I don't know how you navigate between those two juxtapositions. Is it that you delegate certain time for practising these sensory uh, practices and then times when it is task driven or is it something that slowly bleeds into one another over time and when you talk about the overwhelm you mean this you're talking about this openness to everything that is sort of in flux and moving exactly in a way I feel that it's very yeah, like a like a net underneath. Mm. Like I really appreciated hearing you relate your experience of tiredness to the tiredness in the flower after it blooms perhaps and it's had this big outburst. Um, so in a way this interrelation is very comforting. And then at the same time there is this moment when there is so much information that it feels difficult to filter through mm. um, and there are definitely feelings sometimes of wanting to be perceptive at the same time as task-based. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's a big question. <laughs> no, it is a big question and it's like I, I don't think I've ever set myself up with the idea that this kind of perceptual relation, this openness that I'm describing is something that we could even aim to inhabit in a you know sort of a broader sense. I mean, I, I, I've sort of tended to think about it more in terms of encounters as, as moments or events, um, encounters with an outside something that um, forces you to think and maybe stretches the habits of how you think and perceive and tend to to the world differently. I don't think I've ever really stretched it in my mind to think about how how that could happen, you know, in every waking moment. I think that actually kind of leads me to feel immediately overwhelmed, as you were saying, because I think, you know, maybe there's a, the tension is that sometimes we do just have to, um, I don't know, there's, I feel like there's always a, a way that we can reach through the noise to find the hook or the the lure or something that feels generative within it. But I also really like this idea of cherishing these moments where you can feel it as difference, if that makes sense. Like I feel like difference, you know, even like a, a difference in how your sensorium is kind of like figured in a moment. 
I kind of like the excitement of having those moments that perhaps are felt more intensely because they're different to how you're normally um, holding a gesture toward the world or like a um, feeling, sensing, passing the world. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. And I think also in that there is a freedom. I think sometimes I can speak personally that if if there is this moment of busyness or um, multiple things at the same time, I'll often catch myself uh, a little policeman voice perhaps saying, oh, but what about the spider in the corner in that moment? You know, like, yeah. why, why, why didn't you bring them with you? But it's really nice because I think, I, I don't know, I feel that perhaps people can relate to this openness and then the overwhelm that comes from that. So I really like the freedom in, yeah, seeing them as events, seeing them as moments to connect with, attune to, and not feeling an obligation or a pressure to maintain that attention 24 hours a day. Yeah. You know, it's interesting that you chose the voice of a cop to like remind you to be sensitive to the spider (laughs) in the room. But I mean, I think I was thinking about them as this, you know, I think in my thesis, I was calling them threshold events. Um, And maybe I can return to this idea of how can the more than human be artistic, this earlier question. Because, you know, Mm -hmm. what I was trying to do um, was to think about how art can precisely set up these kinds of encounters, these kind of special moments in which you're you're forced to think, in which you are lured to sense, um, you know, a kind of a different um, or to to, to, to engage or to, to attune with the world in a different way. And um, there's, you know, that this was kind of like the, the premise of my thinking about how art creates these thresholds to, to thinking, experiencing, sensing differently. And um, I remember I had this, this tension, you know, that I started with this idea of like how how the tension between wanting something to perform or be a particular way and then being open to what happens. And at the time, I was at, uh, doing a research residency with Erin Manning and the Sense Lab in Montreal, and I was feeling quite stuck because I had this idea um, for an artwork I was developing in collaboration with an artist in Australia, Spence Messi, and we wanted to create... Uh, a sculpture that was a public sculpture that was like an invitation to have an encounter with this threshold event of of sunset. You know, Spence and I had both gone to this really beautiful performance lecture by Mick Talsig at the the HKV in Berlin around sunsets as threshold events. And so we really wanted to create a work that was, you know, basically inviting people to, to have this experience but then the, we were struggling with what form, what form that should take. If this is what we want to happen, how do we how do we make it take that shape? And you know, I was feeling quite stuck. And I met up with Erin for a coffee in this very freezing, wintry Montreal day. I explained to her my problem with this particular work, and you know, how could I make a work that was obedient to my intention which is obviously kind of you know wrong thinking but this is kind of where I was stuck and held and Erin said to me hey Ali uh, what if instead of a sculpture you handed out blankets to everyone so that they could go and watch the sunset and what if at the end someone came back to you and said hey um, thanks for the blanket but instead of watching the sunset my boyfriend and I went and had sex in the woods and it was really great. Um, She said, you know, would that be a failure of the work? And so, you know, I realised then that this frustration, this tension, you know, it's not that the the work itself would fail. What what was failing was this, was my ambition for what it should should be, for for how it should perform. This gap, you know, this, that kind of keeps coming up for me as a, as a threshold, as a, not as a threshold, more as a kind of a, a knot. Um, but yeah, I thought that was a, a very sweet story. 
<laughs> yeah, thank you for sharing. But I think, you know, in my conversation with Erin, it was also, you know, getting to this this tension between thinking and doing that can often be, or for me at least, a stumbling block in, in making art. And that's where this, um, these ideas of techniques came up as a way of sort of um, thinking about that tension that not um, generatively, I guess. Mm. Are there any techniques that you could share with listeners for embodying some of these thoughts that we've talked through today? Yeah, I mean, so I think, you know, the techniques that I talk about are things that come out of experience. So they're particular to your, um, you know, the worlding that happens um, with you and in relation to your world. So the event that you're um, participating in or, or trying to tend in a particular way. You know, the technique in this sense is, is a relay between, between thinking and doing that, you know, in my own um, praxis has to do with tending an artwork in a particular way, tending an art process in a particular way. But I think um, getting back to this invitation to embody it in a particular way, um, you know, I think as I mentioned earlier, techniques aren't blueprints for action. That you know, the techniques that I came up with in my thesis, for instance, are not. Um, it's not to say, oh, you should go and apply these in your own praxis. They came out of the event in particular ways, in this relay between the thinking and doing that was happening in that moment. Um, in this particular moment, my thinking and doing is still very much hovering around this idea of fatigue and this desire to be in and of a world that is not just my living room or not just my bed. Um, and so I was trying to think about how uh, listeners might embody that in a way that's not prescriptive, but that you know becomes for them an opening onto possibilities for sensing and being otherwise. Um, so I was thinking of this really lovely song by a Scottish artist called Eva, or Iva Cutler. Um, it's kind of silly, but it's also beautiful. And it's called, I'm going in a field to lie down. And that's essentially <laughs> the, the gesture. I guess it's a bit difficult now in winter if you're in the Northern Hemisphere. But there's something about this going in a field to lie down. It's also really lovely in terms of the kinds of relation it implies with the field in which you're lying. You know, um, it transports you to a different relation. Um, you know, walking on grass is a kind of, of mastery almost, right? But lying on it or lying with it allows you to attend to all the movements and excesses that extend from being there. Um, there's like a, a word I want to bring up here that this really lovely scholar called Deborah Bird Rose used, which came out, out of her work with Aboriginal communities in the Northern Territory. And the word is shimmer, this kind of sensorial, sensorial richness of landscape, you know, this brilliant excess, the generative excess of complex ecologies, this incandescent pulse of place and life. And, you know, so lying in a field is a way, one way of opening yourself up to the shimmer or opening yourself up to the potential of what unfolds. Or if it's not shimmer, maybe it's opening yourself up to the fatigue of that landscape, the way that in winter, you know, the branches are kind of stripped of leaves and things are quiet and soft. And, you know, this kind of humility and earthy curiosity in lying in the field um, is a way of yeah opening up that encounter sensorially, materially, um, as a way of undoing what you think you know about the world and letting it, it meet you in a different way. Mm. As you were talking, the sun moved across my window and I absolutely will go outside and lie in the grass. I don't know if I can find a field <laughs> within inner city Berlin, but there is a park. There's quite a few parks in Berlin. A park is also an expanse of grass. 
Thank you so much, Ali, for speaking with us today. You're very welcome. Really diving into worlding and helping us dissolve this internal and external divide and worshipping the different mythologies, these amazing characters of desire and sleep and or death. I mean, they're the ones that work for me, but it's also, you know, suggest that people find their own hook, you know, whatever it is that sort of helps you to make that connection. Um, and it can also be different at different times and in different contexts. Um, but it's nice to think about, yeah, um, how, yeah, what, what are the lures that are kind of asking you to feel or sense or think things differently? If listeners would like to work with Ali in person, this is an open invitation to attend a hybrid lab, a free event, which I'm curating and Ali will be facilitating on the 10th of March. So if your agenda is nearby, please jot it down. It's called Moving Across Thresholds and Explores Barriers and the Act of Crossing Them. And that event will be held in person in Kreuzberg, Berlin, and online in a customized format. So if you're listening from Australia, we've referenced Australia or the United States, for example, be sure to check the time differences. But we will be live and we will be online and we will be in person (laughs) experiencing many different worlds and how they overlap. Thank you so much, Ali, for this amazing chat. And I'm looking forward to seeing you in the lab in a few weeks. Thank you so much, Renee. It's been a really exhilarating conversation and lifted me out of my bed for a while. (laughs) Um, And I'm really looking forward to the lab in a few weeks. Yeah. As part of this podcast, just before we part, um, we're practicing the string figure, so passing the microphone on to a speaker, someone who's influenced your world. Is there somebody you've lined up for us to talk to in the next episode? There is indeed. It's um, a friend, an artist, whose name is Lucy Powell. She's also in Berlin. Um, And Lucy and I began as friends and then began working together artistically uh, in a project called Holobiosonics. So with this, we're kind of using this idea of the holobiont, which came out of Lynn Margulis' symbiotic theories, but as a way of, of thinking about, you know, post-individual and complex and entangled ecologies. So, you know, something that was suggestive of a way of working collaboratively in the construction of what we're calling sonic essays, which are themselves these kind of like hybrid symbiotic kind of works. Yeah, so Lucy is... Um, like me, very much invested in investigating non-human worlds. And she's also been active or is an uh, environmental activist. So she kind of brings this energy and practice into our collaboration, which is really nice. Thank you so much. And I wish everyone a wonderful day. Thank you so much, Renee. A wood pigeon has just landed on my balcony and I'm just going to go and have a look at it for a while. (laughs) Perfect. And I'll go lie in the grass. (laughs) Great. (laughs) <laughs> Thank you. Ciao. Ciao. Thank you for listening to the Worlding Podcast. Gefördert durch die Beauftragte der Bundesregierung für Kultur und Medien im Programm Neustart Kultur. Hilfsprogramm des Tanzen des Dachverband Tanz Deutschland.